everyone we are talking about dehydration mechanics in foods and just a quick note before you we jump in too far uh, a lot of people have said wait a second it would be so much uh, uh, so much more useful if we had a lot more science and I'm developing these videos for my students at Niagara College as we're going through the pandemic and I'm um, putting them out there publicly uh, because I have so many alumni from the program who reach out to me and they trust that if they reach out to me, they'll get information and be able to get back to their jobs efficiently and effectively. And to me, that's a really important service. I also am a really public facing food scientist who does a lot of advocacy for the sector in Canada. And I get a lot of people reaching out for information. So I've, I've made these videos available through YouTube. And what uh, those of you who aren't registered in the course don't see is all of the associated stuff that uh, is also shared with the students, activities, learning, um, learning labs, assignments, and eventually that diploma that you get at the end of the program. So today we are going to be talking about dehydration mechanics. And again, it's not going to be heavy on thermodynamics. There are other instructors out there. Um, I highly recommend R. Paul Singh's website. Um, he is a uh, likely the world's best instructor in terms of understanding thermodynamics of food processing systems. And he has a wonderful set of uh, resources available through his online channel. And I highly recommend you check that out. I am focusing really on that introductory skill set and being able to help people overcome their fears of science and overcome their fears of math in particular. Many of the students in this program came from a wide variety of different backgrounds, including students who uh, haven't taken math in years or maybe never took math past grade, uh, grade 9 or grade 10 in high school. And so at the same time, I don't want them to feel intimidated that they can't learn this. And so we take it step by step and people do learn it and that's fantastic. And then they move on to even more advanced um, learnings with all sorts of different resources out there. So today we will be talking about dehydration of foods. And we'll define the importance of water in foods. We'll discuss how water is partitioned in food products. We'll explain how colligative properties of solutes and foods impact on the ability of water to evaporate from food. And you may want to take a look at the colligative properties video if you haven't had the chance to review that, because colligative properties will impact on uh, the capability of dehydration. We'll re describe the role of sensible and latent heat in evaporation processes. We'll define the impact of mass and thermal transfer on rate of dehydration. And we'll use psychrometric charts to track relative humidity and water in process for a number of example processes. And last but not least, we'll apply statistical process control to food dehydration for tracking energy efficiency. Again, that sounds very overwhelming. We're taking this step at a time and we will approach it in a really um, user-friendly format for people who have um, perhaps a limited background in science and mathematics. So, Again, water is one of the most important macronutrients in foods. It makes up a huge percentage of a lot of different food products. And so meats, it could be um, upwards of uh, 50 to 80 percent of the um, uh, proximate composition of a food uh, of a meat product. In the case of fruits and vegetables, it can be upwards of 95 percent in many of these foods. Um, dehydration, though, is historically one of the most important uh, technologies for preserving foods. Prior to advanced um, thermal processing, which was developed by Nicholas Aperit uh, back in the 1800s under the Napoleonic Wars, most of the preservation that was occurring was through dehydration or fermentation because we didn't understand a lot of the germ theory that was going on in terms of spoilage of foods. That said, um, many places where the relative humidity was naturally beneficial and very low allowed for the dehydration of foods. And in other cases, such as in um, northern climates in North America, dehydration by indigenous cultures was an incredibly common technology, and they would take advantage of the psychrometric properties of uh, smoking and uh, bringing in uh, harvested animals during cold periods, bringing them into uh, villages and dehydrating by uh, heating heating their 
their homes and their uh, food preparation areas with with uh, fires. And the psychometric properties of that are absolutely incredible. And so I always want to acknowledge the traditional food uh, processing technologies that have informed the science that we are using today. So water is wonderful. Water is a fantastic molecule and has so many interesting properties. In particular, we've got in the case of water, we've got all of these wonderful partial charges, uh, dipole moments that allow for a lot of complex interactions. And I have a number of uh, videos on the properties of water in foods, and I encourage you to take a look at those as well. In the case of most food systems, water is interacting in a wide variety of different complex forms. And so it's very rare that we find pure water in food products. We are usually looking at water either in solutions, so uh, the water is uh, providing solvation to small molecules, salts and sugars are soluble in water. It is interacting with large molecules such as proteins or polysaccharides, things like uh, dietary fiber, pectin, um, different gums. The water is interacting um, with all of these large molecules Water can be part of emulsions, and emulsions can confound the ability of dehydrating a food product. Also, if you consider an emulsion is an oil in water system, the moment that you remove that water, you are opening up these uh, small particles of oil for oxidative reactions. And so dehydrating oil-based systems, oil-based emulsions, is a much more complex topic, and I have a variety of different uh, strategies for doing this, but uh, you've got a huge surface area and you've got no protective um, interaction from the water encapsulating that. And so the oxidation of that is incredible. But um, last but not least, water can be contained in cellular structures within plant foods or animal foods. And those cellular structures can um, mitigate the mass transfer of that water as well. And so water has all of these different uh, means of compartmentalization. They're, com they're put into different compartments. And so, for example, within this cell, you could have large molecules such as proteins or water of salvation going on. Um, for example, all of the different salts and uh, electrolytes within those cells are also impacting on that. So it's, it's very rare that we're seeing pure water. And that's important to note when we're thinking about uh, the thermodynamic modeling of all of this going on. When we do have pure water, water loves to form crystalline structures. And in the case of ice at low enough temperatures, water does have a, a slightly organized structure in the case of liquid water. And then we have water molecules in water vapor or gas form. And that's what we're trying to achieve when it comes to dehydration processes. We are trying to get water into the gas form and remove it from foods. And we can do it directly from ice. We can also do more commonly do it from liquid water. But uh, freeze drying is a reasonably common technology. We're going to spend more of our time today talking about uh, dehydration of uh, warm systems, so where the water is in liquid water form. So what's going on when we're dehydrating? Well, we've got to have some sort of sensible heat increase. Oh, I should have changed this y-axis. That, that sensible heat increase then allows for latent heat to be increasing. And then we have an increase in sensible heat again. What is that sensible heat? That is the temperature change that we can feel. And so we're seeing that by change in temperature that we can read on a thermometer. In the case of latent heat, latent heat, if we go back here, the latent heat is the heat that allows for the change of a molecule from the solid state to the liquid state or the liquid state to the gaseous state. So latent heat, latent heat is that heat that doesn't show up on a thermometer. It goes strictly to the transition of the bonds that you have to go from solid to liquid or liquid to gas. And so we are taking advantage of latent heat in the case of dehydration. We need to apply heat in some form or change 
the partial pressure of the water within the atmosphere. And so we take advantage of both of those impacts and most dehydration where we have a hot air stream traveling over a food product. That's the most common means of dehydration using forced air and heated air in general. And so again, we're taking advantage of either heating that product or we're using the partial pressure of the water within the atmosphere. Now, what complicates this whole thing, if you watched the video on colligative properties, when the water is interacting um, because of the colligative properties, you've got a change of the order of the water molecules. This is an example of sodium chloride in solution. And we had this wonderful, um, slightly randomized um, molecular structure going on in the liquid water. When we have dissolved molecules, we end up with these um, forms of solvation where the water is, is uh, creating a different molecular structure and it, it then requires more energy it requires either more latent heat to be applied or we need to modify the partial pressure even more considerably to be able to have that water go into the uh, vapor pressure or vapor vapor phase pardon me so in class we had a, a quick example that we were doing uh, together we we sliced up some apples. I made a thick apple and we put approximately 100 grams onto the dehydrator. And we also made some really thin apple and we sliced it approximately 0.4 centimeters thick. And what we did was we tracked over time. So the class ran for um, about two and a half hours. And during that time, we tracked the mass in the dehydrator. We, we turned the dehydrator, just a forced air dehydrator, to I believe 60 degrees Celsius, and we ran the air over this. What are we seeing in this case? The red apple was very thick and the blue apple was very thin. Well, what we are seeing here is the um, what's going on in terms of heat transfer and mass transfer. So on a thicker product, it's going to take longer for that heat to transfer to the center of the product and for the mass, in this case the water, to escape from that product. A thinner, a thinner uh, profile product, the heat transfer is going to be much more rapid because it doesn't have as far to travel in, in case of the dimensions of that product. And the mass transfer is easier because, again, it doesn't have as far to travel. If you are interested, uh, do take a look at some of the thermal diffusivity calculations and mass transfer calculations that Paul Singh is doing on his channel because uh, he does a lot more in terms of the thermodynamics. But I want to uh, leave the students that I work with with the knowledge that if you want to increase the efficiency on a dehydration operation, you need to uh, decrease the dimensions of that product, make it thinner, or you need to somehow uh, increase the heat transfer to that product. So making it thinner is going to do that. But for example, if you are making, let's say, fruit leather, are you starting with that product cold? Or are you putting that fruit leather in hot so that you don't have the same in, uh, initial thermal um, thermal load that you have to overcome to get to the, the, the thermal state where you're uh, taking advantage of the latent heat? So some of these different approaches are important to think about. In many cases, uh, dehydration processes are very, very long. In the, we've talked a lot about um, TOC and uh, constraint um, and throughput uh, accounting in some of our other classes. And we know that we, in most food processing, um, other than traditional food processing, we want to increase the throughput because throughput means efficiency. Traditional food processing, different story, and many traditional dehydration operations take weeks or in some cases um, much longer to be able to achieve what they need to do. That's a very different scenario, but take home message, thick products take longer to have heat transfer and longer to have mass transfer. Thin products 
faster heat transfer, faster mass transfer. And therefore, if you are dehydrating, look at the dimensions of your product to get it as thin as possible. Now, what's going on in that dehydration process? The initial part of the dehydration process, you've got this adjustment period. And again, that's where you've got, um, I should have put on the x-axis here, x-axis time. So what's going on? Initially, we have that adjustment period where the cold product going into the dehydrator is going to be adjusting in its uh, internal temperature so that you start to change from sensible heat transfer to latent heat transfer. And then you have this constant rate period. And in general, that's where you are evaporating the free water, the water that's not um, bound into so many of those um, complex structures, especially the water of solvation for colligative properties. You you have that free water being transferred, and that's a constant rate period. And then you've got this uh, third zone here, which is uh, considered the falling rate period. Here we are starting to evaporate bound water, and so it's taking more heat, and we have um, we have uh, a, a bigger uphill battle in terms of overcoming that latent heat necessary to uh, remove the water. The, the benefit is usually when we're getting to this falling rate period, the relative humidity and the partial pressure within that dehydration system starts to shift in terms of its advantage so that we're taking advantage more on the, the partial pressure of the water within the atmosphere. So again, what are we seeing? Initial sensible heat, then we're having that latent heat applied, and then we have that transition to uh, sensible heat again. And so as we're getting back into this falling rate period, the, the temperature of the product typically increases um, much more substantially. So we talked about this, and I can't stress this enough, when you've got colligative properties in that product. So maybe you've got dissolved salts, or you've got dissolved sugar, that may, you're making fruit leather. If you've got dissolved sugar in your system, then it's going to make... Uh, evaporation of the water more difficult and so in some cases I, I think of uh, traditional tomato paste manufacturing they will often take advantage of an initial period of heating that product and releasing a lot of the free water but add the salt at a later point so that the dehydration mechanics are easier on the front end so again stress this enough, um, small molecules, salts and sugars in particular, are going to have colligative properties and that's going to impact on the efficiency of your dehydration process. Now let's jump into some psychrometrics. I, I, again, I'm going to take a really user-friendly approach to this and uh, Paul Singh has some really fantastic resources and I encourage you to check them out. This is a psychrometric chart and it's uh, produced by ASHRAE and it's the engineering association that focuses on heating and refrigeration. And this chart looks really, really complicated, but we'll walk through some of the different features and how it relates to dehydration or um, other mechanics related to uh, water in the air. So first off, I uh, used a, uh, a dry bulb and wet bulb thermometer. And honestly, it's a thermometer and uh, it's a two-in-one thermometer, two thermometers stuck together. One of them has a small piece of cotton covering the end. You dip it in water and then you you wave it around in the air. Some of them have a, a chain or a they almost look like nunchucks and you wing it around until you get the uh, the wet bulb and dry bulb temperature. Many many different uh, electronic devices are now available that just immediately measure relative humidity. But what I what I did with my wet bulb thermometer was I winged it around my head in the class, and we found that the dry bulb temperature was 22 degrees Celsius, and the wet bulb temperature, so wet bulb, dry bulb is on the um, vertical axis. So the uh, what's interesting, it, it, it lines up on the x-axis down here, but you're going to see the dry bulb lines going vertically. So when I talk about axes in these charts, 
Um, I often talk about the wrong direction and I'll say, well, it's the vertical axis and people think, well, that's the Y axis. No, um, dry bulb is along the X axis down here, but you're lining it up vertically. So we had 22 degrees Celsius in the classroom and then we found the wet bulb temperature and the wet bulb is going along here on this sloping angle. So wet bulb over here, let me highlight this again for you, wet bulb is going to be on these sloping lines and so we had a wet bulb temperature of 13 so I had drawn this line here which means our intercept was right here and I realize my dot now is so monstrously big but what I could do from there is I can track that line horizontally across and now I know I've got six grams per kilo dry air and that's how much water is in the air on a per kilo of air basis and I also can track what is my relative humidity and so I've got a relative humidity in here that is I realize my dot has has exploded in terms of its physical size but it was lining up to be about 33 percent relative humidity now, something else that you can note here is that over, over here, there is what's called the enthalpy cal or, uh, that is calculated based off of the air parameters that you got. And what that enthalpy is, is it's the amount of energy that's in that air per kilo of dry air. And this is more important for HVAC or refrigeration technologists who need to know, they need to know and be able to make a calculation. How much energy is it going to take to heat? Let's say my air coming in is at this point and I need it to be at, I don't know, 40 degrees. How much energy is it going to take? And these enthalpy calculations are, are more important for them, but uh, it's worth noting that's also on this chart. So let's walk through some examples of what can be done with this chart. So I, as I mentioned before, I had measured my dry bulb at 22 and my wet bulb at 13 and I found my intercepts there. We found the relative humidity on these wonderful slope, uh, sloped curves going up. And so we start at 100%. This would be the 100% line here and then going down by 10% increments. So you have to you have to sort of eyeball it and make a good estimate. We were in between the 30 and 40 lines, and I estimated a 33% relative humidity. So from a partial pressure perspective, the lower the relative humidity in terms of percent, the, the more energetically favorable it's going to be to have a dehydration process. So that's one aspect. We want to push that relative humidity as low as possible at the same time, being cognizant that if we push it so low, we're spending a lot of money on energy. So we also did that, that uh, calculation. We can push based off of that dot. We know that at the current uh, status, it's 36 kilos or 36 kilojoules per kilo dry air. Depending on how much we want to heat our system, we could do a calculation and say per kilo dry air, Here's much, how much energy we would need to be adding into the system on a routine basis. Now, I did another example here where what would happen if I started with my air at, let's say 22 degrees and at 30, it was 33% relative humidity. What happens if I heat that air up? Well, I'm I, what I'm doing is I'm I'm taking the air at that 22 degrees and I'm heating it up along the dry bulb temperature. So let's say I heated my air from 22 to 45 degrees Celsius. The thing is, in that heating process, I am not adding any additional moisture. And so if I go out on this horizontal line, my moisture content remains the same. I always at this, under these conditions, I have six grams per kilo dry air. And under those conditions, I heat my air up. I am still at six grams per kilo dry air. However, what has shifted is my relative humidity. And so the intercept now is 
is pushing close to 9% relative humidity, from going from 22 and 6 grams to 45 degrees Celsius dry bulb, we now have 9% relative humidity. And again, the lower the relative humidity, the more energetically favorable our partial pressure for dehydration. Now, I used an example. That's actually a photo of my brother-in-law and uh, my husband's cousin. My husband's cousin happens to be a grape grower in Iran, and he um, produces artisanal raisins for the market. And in Iran, the relative humidity naturally within the atmosphere is extremely low. And as such, he can actually just take the grapes on the vine and leave them hanging in his, in his drying shed, and they will naturally form raisins. And I went on, I, I went to visit him a couple years ago and took these photos. Now, I often get questions about uh, fruit dehydration in Niagara. I live in uh, the Niagara region, which is uh, one of Canada's premier fruit production regions. And oftentimes we are asked the question, why do we not make dried fruit in Niagara? Well, Niagara's natural relative humidity is extremely high because we have Lake Ontario and Lake Erie and the Niagara River and Niagara Falls and all of that water lends itself to the um, the atmospheric relative humidity being extremely high. This is a uh, uh, Roman, the viticulturalist at Vineland Estates, and I just I when I saw this photo, I thought how uncanny he looks like my he sort of looks like my uh, my husband's cousin. Um, but uh, let's walk through this example. So let's say the average daytime uh, dry bulb temperature in both Iran and Niagara Falls is at 30 degrees Celsius, and let's say the relative humidity in Iran is sitting at approximately 25%. They've got about 6.5 grams per kilo dry air. So the water in the air is much lower. If we look at the same conditions, let's say we're at 90% relative humidity in Niagara, and that's not uncommon in the month of August to have that sort of relative humidity. And we're also at 30 degrees Celsius. Um, no, oh, where's my pen? There's my pen. So we're up here. Now the air conditions in Niagara Falls are pushing 25 grams per kilo of dry air. So we've got 25 grams of water versus 6.5 grams of water. And we have, a, so energetically, the relative humidity means that just naturally, we couldn't we couldn't hang grapes in Niagara and allow them to naturally dehydrate. We we have to then heat the air and reduce either the relative humidity, so we're reducing the partial pressure, allowing for it to be more energetically favorable for dehydration, or we have to somehow dehydrate the air, and that costs money. We have to pay for the energy to do that, and as such, it's it's much more cost effective for the folks in Niagara to make wine rather than make raisins. Now, here's another example when um, psychrometric charts are used, and this is not so much from a dehydration perspective. This one's more from a refrigeration perspective. But uh, this is a common scenario that I faced uh, and a reason why I use psychrometric charts. When working in uh, refrigeration or uh, freezer plants, you have all that intake air and you've got to figure out how you're managing that. So let's walk through this one. This one's a little bit more complicated. Now, I'm working in Niagara. And so summertime, 30 degrees Celsius is quite common. So our dry bulb temperature is at 30 degrees Celsius. So that was, I, I put that number one line there. Um, 30 degrees Celsius dry bulb temperature, but often we're pushing like 80, 90% relative humidity. I said 80%. Let's be generous today. And we've got air intake in our refrigeration plant at 30 degrees um, and 80% relative humidity. So that's 22 grams per kilo of dry air. Now, let's say we've got the air intake and we're cooling it down in the refrigerator. So what's happening? First thing, it's as we're cooling down, we're going down that dry bulb. What's happening to our relative humidity? Well, we're going along this line here. And our relative humidity 
when we're hitting about, well, let's jump right down there. Ooh, oh, I'm not very good at drawing a straight line. 29, 28, 27, about 20, uh, 25.5 degrees. That is what we call our dew point. The dew point is at the point at which we are hitting 100% relative humidity and the water starts to condense out of the air. So we start at 22 degrees or 22 grams per kilo dry air. We're cooling this air down. So we hit 25.5 degrees um, dry bulb temperature and we've hit our dew point. Let's write dew point. So 25 degrees. Now everything water-wise is condensation until we get down to our refrigeration temperature of 4 degrees Celsius. And if we, if we draw the line across here in terms of our differential, we're at 5 grams per kilo dry air. We're losing 17 grams of water per kilo of dry air. And... That's really important to note that um, all that water is going somewhere. And in many uh, refrigeration and freezer plants, that water is ending up as condensation on walls, on product, on ceilings. And in uh, many of the refrigeration plants that I've worked in, it can be almost rainy inside the plants. And that rain can be a point of cross-contamination. And so what we recommend to a lot of the freezer plants is to have some sort of dehydration mechanism where the, on their in, air intake, they're actually cooling the water lower than 4 degrees and then bringing it back up to 4 degrees. Some sort of dehydration mechanism prior to the air entering the uh, freezer cooler plant. The problem is you can't go too low. You need to maintain some relative humidity or you'll start to dehydrate at your product. Now, in other cases... I have I have some plants that I work with where they're uh, they're they're running this dehydration cycle, but then they're bringing it back up to let's say ambient at twenty degrees in the summertime. Now with the relative humidity, it's pushing like thirty five percent, and this is common in a lot of high precision um, food processing, such as the cannabis market that's uh, producing cannabis edibles products. They want to treat it almost like a pharmaceutical environment where the relative humidity is very tightly controlled. So you can go and rewarm that air, and now the relative humidity is extremely low. So using uh, a dehumidifier, which is cooling the air, dropping the water out, and then rewarming there, can be beneficial in terms of modifying your relative humidity. How about uh, one last example? This is a fish flake in Newfoundland, and it's a very traditional way of dehydrating fish. Well, in this case, you could be pushing the fish down to the freezing point and just atmospherically and any sort of, you see this uh, confluence down here of all of these, all of these relative humidity points. You have this sort of maximal amount of moisture that you can have in the air when the air is very, very cold. And in many atmospheres in, or many climates in uh, Canada, the air is very, very cold naturally. Any sort of heating operation allows for a huge change in temperature. So if, let's say, our product started at 2 degrees and our air is 5 degrees or 5 grams per kilo dry air, and let's say just uh, from uh, radiant heat from the sun, it's heating up to, let's say... 10 degrees Celsius uh, as a microclimate. Even if the atmosphere... Uh, 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 so let's say we are getting that microclimate. We have the potential of... 3 grams differential. We're at 8 grams per kilo dry air. And the air exchange is phenomenal because they're out in the open atmosphere. This is a very traditional product and it's not made very commonly anymore, but traditional processing still exists in a lot of different areas. I've, I've seen fish drying operations in um, South Asia where, again, they're taking advantage of the radiant heat from the sun to create that microclimate around the product and heat the product and allow for dehydration. So I didn't talk very much at all about enthalpy, but the, again, that's the heat required to have that 
increase in air heat. And how is this normally tracked in the industry? Yes, uh, the ASHRAE engineers who are doing um, the design of these sorts of systems are often doing these enthalpy calculations. But what are we typically seeing in the industry on existing systems? What we're seeing is more commonly Schuhart charts or control charts where you're tracking utilities consumption, or consumption per mass load or time to completion um, per mass load or uh, doing some sort of multivariate model with relative humidity, utilities consumption and mass load. But uh, tracking all of these different variables allows you to see uh, the, the typical uh, range and the typical mean for the consumption of these of these different parameters or the outcomes of these different parameters. So that was a really rapid fire approach to dehydration technology. And I always love to hear your questions or your comments. I have a couple of requests for videos. And so I'm excited to do those videos. And I look forward to hearing from you real soon. Take care.